Let's just do this. All right, let's do it, man. <laughs> All right, Elliot. Elliot, where are you from originally? I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Oh, you're from LA? Yeah. And you live now in? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. And tell me about your family growing up. Uh, well, I grew up a uh, middle class family. Mom was a school teacher and dad was an uh, electrical engineer and, uh, you know, went to just sort of normal schools. Um, nothing super crazy in my childhood, you know, divorce and drugs and the usual kind of, mm -hmm. you know, good times. But I grew up in the, you know, in the valley in the late 60s, early 70s. And that was, you know, we we're all getting high. Right. How, uh, how far did you go in school? Well, I ended up getting a PhD in mathematics, uh, and then I uh, became a professor of mathematics and did that. I got tenure in that, uh, gave up that tenured position and got another one at UC Santa Barbara in computer science, and I uh, was there. So yeah, did a couple of uh, university gigs for about 20 years, and uh, then opened a little uh, consulting business for the casino industry. Did that for about 10 years, and, and yeah, brings me up to date. And you describe yourself as a doomer. I absolutely am a doomer. Tell me how your your education and your careers have influenced your stand well, as a doomer. Well, what I, I notice is that uh, there's a lot of people who sort of overinterpret information. They look at whatever the latest fad is and they sort of go down that road. And I just thought I was kind of uh, uniquely positioned having a background in mathematics, computer science, and gambling, right? Risk, analyzing risk. And also a childhood, I was a meteorologist. I, I actually, it's what I wanted to do growing up. So I just started um, reading the papers and looking at the facts and watching a bunch of YouTube videos and, and going to the actual scientific journals and you know, kind of taking the whole spectrum of people who are out there from those who are like, humanity is going to be extinct by 2026 to those who are like, oh, no, there's actually nothing wrong at all going on. Right. So the whole huge spectrum and just sort of putting the evidence together as best I could. Right. And, and especially, you know, realizing uh, early on that there aren't a lot of super educated people out there like myself who are on the doomer side. Right. It's just it's very rare. And so I instantly my voice was sort of instantly recognized in the in the area. I have a YouTube channel and a. Uh, what is your YouTube channel? Um, my YouTube channel is uh, Climate Casino at Climate Casino. They changed it so it might be also at Climate Disaster, um, and my uh, website is climatecasino.net. Got it. Okay. And you've had this belief that we're going to hell since when? Um, oh, really, I mean, the first memory I have of it was in Ohio in 1983 or four. Uh, when Reagan was president, we were all, um, you know, storing water in the basement, expecting nuclear war to break out any moment. I mean, it's just I, I've sort of grown up, uh, you know, with this uh, real dislike for humanity, for what we've done to the planet, you know, especially kind of the Western version of, uh, of how we've operated. And so, you know, I lived in a teepee for a while when I was in grad school and, and um, I was a vegetarian for a long time. So I've sort of, you know, I, I went to the Earth Day in 1977 when Timothy Leary was speaking at UC Davis. So, I mean, I, as long as I, I've been an adult, really, it's been on my mind, these general sorts of themes. Mm -hmm. Would you describe yourself as a someone who's negative or a pessimist in general throughout your life? Um, or are you using like information? I, I wouldn't say a, a pessimist. Uh, I would say a realist. You know, I've, I, I've been around a lot of pessimists who just look at everybody, you know, as everything has a dark, a dark motive. And I don't feel that way. I, I honestly feel there's a lot of good people who, who are doing their best and many are making, you know, doing incredible things. I single out arts and music and medicine and science, you know, and all the people involved in those areas, physics, that's just, to me, that's, that's what humanity's, you know, goal was. And, and for me, art is number one of those. And medicine is number two, because I think art is our purpose on the planet to create beauty, you know, to, to ha develop a sense of beauty and create it. And medicine's great because it makes us live a longer time so we can create more art, right? So for me, that's one and two. But, you know, there are plenty of, uh, of not so great things humans have done, too. So I'm not really a pessimist. I'm just I 
I mean, it's, it, pessimist is like an attitude. I, I'm more of a realist in every way, I'd say. And what, what do you think we are destined to see? I mean, what, what kind of things are going to unfold here in the next well, it's, it kind of depends on where you live on the planet. If you're in the Horn of Africa right now in the sixth year of drought, you know, you have a million people dying of hunger today. Or if you're in Pakistan where 30 million people got flooded out last summer, or you're in the bush, you know, trying to be a koala in Australia, or, you know, 115 degrees in Argentina last week. And the latest prediction is minus 50 degrees uh, you know, Fahrenheit might happen up in Montana. So when you when you actually see in real time disasters happening over and over again, and then you ask the question, you know, kind of when is this going to happen or how do you see this playing out? It's really just a question of understanding it's already playing out, right? The, the collapse, like what's happening in the UK right now, you know, they essentially have no health care anymore. You can't get an ambulance. You know, the whole health care system is collapsing. They're, they're, they're having hyperinflation, you know. So... I would say I would say uh, collapse is ongoing. It's beginning and ongoing. Um, you know, I'm not one like like a lot of people want to predict. They want to give you dates. They want to say, here's a date certain this thing will happen by then. But that's why I have the casino mentality. So what I like to do is give odds. You know, I say the odds are this thing will happen, you know, by this date. And so I, I actually, uh, you know, flavor everything with percentages that way. And uh, for me right now, you know, I'm, uh, when the Arctic loses its ice, that's going to be a bad year for the planet. Uh, we're going to have some uh, major superheating going on. You know, when we have El Nino happening, uh, predicted for late 2023, then we're talking about, um, you know, breaking through that Paris 1.5 real quickly, which means all these other tipping points whether it's, uh, you know, the, the Thwaites Glacier down in Antarctica or, uh, you know, the Brazilian rainforest tipping into, tipping so it's, you know, just becomes a grassland. I mean, all of these things, we are right on the edge of all of these things, right? And the, these tipping points, is not like just one tipping point. It's this whole sequence of cascading tipping points, you know, one one leads to the next and the next. So, um, yeah, so we're right on the edge of that, right? And when that process really gets going, when the first big one hits, right, then we're going to have this... this uh, a series of them. Yeah, a series, very quickly unfolding. And, and it's, it's, it's truly going to be ugly for the planet. It's sad. I mean, my, my thing is that it's sad. I'm just, I, you talked about a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist, but I am sad. I, I'm deeply, deeply sad about the loss of humanity, the loss of human legacy, you know, all the beauty that humans have created. It's, it's, it's a societal construction, it's a mental construction, right? But we still appreciate it as beauty. You know, my dog doesn't think, you know, a song is beautiful, but I do, right? So I really mourn the loss of beauty and I, I mourn all that humans have, have created that is, it, you know, something that, that is a treasure that a mind is capable of that. And losing that, lo losing legacy is what makes me sad. It's just the idea of losing legacy. Was, was this avoidable? No, no, absolutely unavoidable at this point. No, I mean, at this point, but was it avoidable? Like, like if, if 100 years ago, mankind well, did something? Well, no, it was not avoidable as soon as we discovered that we could use oil. Um, once we found oil, it was all over. It was done. Uh, internal combustion, burning coal, you know, to power industrial civilization, 1750 and, and so we, on. We didn't realize the damage we were doing then. Well, it's not that we're doing damage. It's that we, I mean, you have to use the analogy of the virus in the Petri dish. You know, you have, you have essentially um, a thousand generations of humans staying pretty much stable at between 500 million and a billion people, right? How you were born is how you were going to die. There wasn't going to be a great change in the standard of your living during your life, right? If there was one new invention every 100 generations or, or 10 generations, that was a great way to extend life, right? So once um, we got a hold of this food, right, this oil, it's food, that's free energy for us, and we learn how to turn this free energy into stuff, right, and into into vehicles and cars and, and industry and, and more people and more buildings and everything that, that's destroying the planet. Once we got to that point, we're now, we're now you know, 10, 15 generations. So we have a thousand generations where we were 
good to the planet, right? Now we got 10 where we've completely screwed it up. And you know, it's, it's, this is human nature. When, when you know, humans have been wiping out species on this planet as long as there's been humans around, there's no such thing as like a benevolent, peaceful species. There are just species, you know, uh, there's just humans that haven't had oil, right? That haven't had industry. So yeah, when could we have stopped it if, if we had, you know, somewhere around 1750, by some miracle, never discovered oil or what we could do, coal. And there's no hope now. Oh, no. No hope now. It's the, what, what, what are the biggest problems we face? The environmental, uh, the, uh, the climate? Um, well, when you talk about problems, you know, it's, it's like, what does the problem do? Um, for many people, the problem is food. You know, we are, uh, talking right now about 700 million people being uh, living lives with deficient food resources. Um, you know, they're expecting that to be well over a billion people by the end of the decade. That's an eighth of the people on the planet underfed, undernourished. It could be heat waves, you know, it could be where you live suddenly becomes uninhabitable uh, due to heat, which could very well happen in Phoenix. It could, you know, it could happen in large parts of Africa within the next couple of years. Um, it could be drought, which is what we're experiencing here. You know, um, Lake Mead is just five, um, five years or so away, five more drought years from, from essentially losing the water entirely because it's going to go dead pool. It's going to go below the point where it can actually drain and feed the line. So, you know, once you have that, you have mass migration. Well, once you have mass migration, you have people having little... Uh, you know, civil wars because they want to protect their turf. You know, when we're talking about internal migration within this country, you know, let's just let's just transport uh, 20 million uh, Southern Californians somewhere in the country. Go ahead. Tell me where, you know, where are you going to put 20 million people? So you're going to have a lot of civil strife, civil, um, you know, a lot of in the street fighting going on. And you already see that in lots of places. You know, you're likely to see fascism. Um, come up, you know, we just barely escaped it in the last election. But, you know, Russia, what's happening in Russia right now is a typical example of what you're going to see more of, um, you know, clinging to power, clinging, clinging to wealth when everything else is falling apart. You know, what's happening to Twitter with Elon Musk right now is, is you know, he he is saying things that are outright fascist, you know, so it's 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 this whole sort of uh, spectrum of things that are going to fall apart. It's not one single thing in one place. It's not the climate, right? It's not um, food. It's not population, right? It's just, it's just this whole spectrum. Uh, and I actually have listed 40 uh, different um, things that can happen. Releasing new viruses is one of them, right? Um, volcanism is another one because there's this, uh, this thing called isos isostatic rebound. So as the ice melts, for example, on Greenland, right, it, it actually changes the gravitational field of Greenland. That's how much ice is melting. You, you reduce that green weight on Greenland by that much, then, then the land of Greenland, the underlying land, is rising up, right, because it doesn't have the weight on it. Well, that creates um, uh, pressures on the tectonic plates, right, which creates more volcanism. And so you get more earthquakes, right? So, I mean, there's just unbelievable, if you actually look at the full spectrum of what's coming down, it's, it's all over the place. Is it depressing for you? Um, it, it makes me very sad. Yeah. And I separate being sad from being depressed. And my separation is that I am active every day doing everything I can. I, I spend every day doing everything I can. A depressed person doesn't do that. They crawl into a hole and, and just say, woe is me, you know, life is horrible. So, you know, I, I have sort of a, um, a mantra I go by in my life. And it has three prongs to it. And the first prong is um, service. Find a way to, to serve your community or serve the planet or serve people in need. Do something to give of your time, you know, to, to, to help the, those in need, to, to call attention to, you know, whatever you can do. Uh, the second one is generosity. We all don't have the funds or the money or the ability to give, right? But to whatever extent I'm able, I, I try and be generous. I try and be, you know, 
give, right? And, and uh, even if it's food or clothing or whatever, just constantly thinking about that. And the third is kindness. And kindness, just it's exactly that. It's like, just take a breath and be kind because there's no reason to be anywhere else than kind. At this point in the collapse of civilization and the collapse of the planet, there's no reason not to be kind. And I don't care who the person voted for, right? I don't care you know, what their political views are. I don't care what their views are on the vaccine. You know, I just don't care. I want to be kind to this person. I fail at that one more than any other. I will freely admit I fail my kindness test. But, you know, the, the sort of pinnacle theme to this, this activism is, is this um, saying that if I can um, preserve the beauty of one flower for one more day, then I've done enough, right? Just, just go out today and think how you can help one flower survive one more day. And if we all did our part? We'd have a lot more flowers, but we're not gonna have a lot more days. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, just a terribly sad time. But you know, there's this sort of weird paradox um, and this was a Harvard study that was 2017, 2018, where they said that, um, you know, when you preach hope, when you preach that uh, optimism, that we can fix this, that we can do something, then what en ends up happening is that people think, well, that means there's somebody fixing it. There's somebody doing it, right? That, that means I get a free pass. I don't have to do anything because, hey, if we can fix it, great. It's being fixed, right? So hope actually is... Um, disinviting for people to um, be activists. It actually uh, sort of numbs people to activism. And it turns out that, that the doomer message is the message of activism. It is the message of go out and do stuff. You know, like, like um, a friend of mine who, who just creates a farm, you know, and his, his activism is, is let's grow some food and let's, um, you know, find places to, to donate this food. I mean, that's activism, right? And that's, that's not what a depressed person does, is say, hey, let me find a way to spend my summer growing food so I can give it away. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I am 100% I am um, behind the notion that the reality of where we are right now as a species and in the history of humanity um, sort of should propel us towards activism but activism um, as a humanist, right? Not activism as, as I'm gonna fight big oil or I'm gonna you know, work for this political candidate or I'm gonna go plant more trees or you know, I'm gonna go glue my hands to a, a famous painting in a museum. That's, that's not the kind of activism, right? Activism is saying, I'm gonna go volunteer for the wildlife rescue and help them you know, clean the bird cages, right? I'm going to go um, help this nonprofit distribute food to, to needy people. You know, the activism means find, going right to the place where there is pain and hurt and, and suffering and doing something right at that direct connection where you can, make, you can see the difference you're making right there. Everything else is layers of abstraction away. You go fighting big oil. That is so many layers of abstraction away from what we're seeing on the streets you know, even around here, right? That is, that's miles away. But you go out on the streets and you, you give something to someone or you help them with something, entirely different way to go through your life. And so that's, that's what I preach. That's the activism. And that's what being a doomer has given me, is this comfort that I don't have to be political, this comfort that I don't have to worry about issues, that I don't have to engage in fights with people, that I don't have to, to be a... Um, argumentative about things. I can let other people be right. I don't need to be right. I don't need to get into to social media fights. I don't need to, you know, argue. I just, I just act, just act. You're, you're definitely not the stereotypical crazy doomer. I, um, you know, I don't know that many doomers, um, but my experience, um, and I, I will say this with my climate casino, right? Because I do a lot of odds, is that I set my lines for my wagers. This is a weird world I live in, 
is my history in the casino industry. Mm -hmm. I set my line for my wagers, assuming that all the doomers are going to take make the worst. They're going to think it's going to happen worse, faster, quicker than it will. So, you know, I, I just put up a wager um, recently about whether um, I thought uh, the world would break the Paris Agreement 1.5C in the year 2024. I'm getting about 80% people saying yes, right? And I'm, I don't think there's a chance we're going to break 1.5C. And, and that's like the year after next, right? And so I see this sort of um, among the Doomer community that there's this tendency to think it's going to be faster and worse and hard in the next just one or two or three years, and then it's going to be done. We're going to be dead in five years. It's, you know, um, we're going to have one ice-free Arctic, and then it's doomed. We're all over. And that's not how it's going to play out. It's going to be slow and painful and hard, and it's going to be just a terrific amount of suffering. And it's, it's already beginning, you know, and, and you know, I, I think part of the reason I, I do this climate casino is I want to pe see people uh, get it wrong. I want them to get it wrong so that they will understand that they are, as doomers, you know, erring on, on the side of, of too much doom, which may depress them, which may make them inactive. That really, when I set a line, I mean it, that this is, I'm trying to get you to understand something about physics and reality here. Is it just human nature that we, as a species, humans tend to self-destruct? Um, is it human nature that humans tend to self-destruct? Um, I, I think nature eventually conspires on all civilizations. You know, there hasn't been a civilization that's persisted yet through the, the eon. So ultimately, there is some reason every civilization collapses. Um, I think this is the first time we're going to have global collapse of civilization, um, which means every civilization everywhere. Um, there may be some holdouts, you know, civilizations that are make it longer, figure out how to adapt. I'm not calling, saying that the whole planet's going to go extinct. And many of these doomers, just, they, they will tell you, oh, yes, we will all be extinct in a couple of years. It's crazy talk, right? Um, and it's the kind of talk that keeps you from being an activist, right? To think, oh, yeah, live for today, do what you can today, enjoy, you know. One of the things I often say is that um, one of the worst ideas humanity ever came up with is carpe diem, live for today. And the fact that that's preached in books and, and media and movies, right? And, and you hear people say it, carpe diem, live for today. That is um, the mentality of use resources, use resources, destroy your environment, um, you know, buy toys, buy crap, do whatever you can do today to take as much as you can from the world for your personal gain. And that's the exact opposite. So when, when you hear carpe diem preached as somehow a slogan of enlightenment, like live for today, as, as if that should entitle you to abuse the planet, um, it is the, it's just the exact opposite of, of the philosophy that I have. And yet it is the philosophy of these near-term extinction folks that, hey, we're going to be dead in three years. Let's live for today. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. And so some, some of us may survive. There might be a small percentage that... Um, I, again, I'm not one to um, make per uh, percentage guess, but I do have a wager. Um, my first wager is the population will still be over 8 billion in the year 2025. And I actually have somebody who thinks it's going to be under that, um, betting against me. And then I have a wager, I believe um, I'm betting the population will be under 4 billion by the year 2060. It might be 2050, I don't recall. In other words, I am thinking over the next 30 years or so, we are going to have enough global catastrophe taking place that there is going to be a significant uh, die off of humanity. But I would not go beyond that 4 billion. I don't have enough information, and it just feels reckless to make predictions without sufficient information, unless you want to make a name for yourself by making predictions like that. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people do. So it'll be famine, it'll be disease. It, it's going to be famine, disease, uh, war, um, 
heat, um, you know, yeah, it's, there are many direct causes that, that you can find. Um, but I would say famine is the one that is going to lead the way. And we could easily le lose three to five million people next year in Africa to famine. I mean, easily, if you look at what's happening in Somalia right now, it's just devastating, it's over the top devastating. And, and I give, it's one of my charities is to give to these world food organizations. So yeah, absolutely, 100% heartbreaking. And if we were all more generous, kinder, more giving to each other, do you think that would delay things or help or I don't, prevent? I don't have a solution for other people. Um, it's the way I choose to lose my, uh, lose my life. That's a slip. Um, yeah, lose because I'm 65 now, right? So I'm losing my life actively over the next 20 years regardless. But um, it's how I choose to live my life. And um, there's, I don't have a solution. I don't have something I can recommend to other people. You know, it's, um, it's everybody has to follow, find their own way through this mess. Um, and I'm not about to tell another person what they should or shouldn't be doing. I think the awareness of, of our predicament, the awareness of our predicament is causing a lot of anxiety, especially in young people right now. Mm -hmm. And that's really sad to see that happening, uh, especially people late teens through their 20s. They know. They know that by the year 2100, there's not going to be Hong Kong and there's not going to be Florida and there's not going to be, you know, major parts of major ports around the world are gone. And, and what does that mean? It means we can't have shipping, you know, the major highways along the coast will be gone. Okay. So we can't have trucking, you know, along the, I mean, we don't, we can't rebuild this infrastructure. That's not happening. And even if we did, we're trying to rebuild it for conditions that are beyond anything we can predict. You know, when, when all the roads get wiped out in, in North Yellowstone, like they did, uh, last summer, how do you even begin to rebuild that? Because you don't know what climate you're building things for. You don't know the building standards you should have. So, so I think it's really hard for the kids right now. So I do think the more they understand this um, predicament, the better choices they'll make in their own life. And many of them are. You know, many of them are are already foregoing having children. They're foregoing the idea of having a long career. They're trying, they are, are choosing um, lifestyles that give them more experiences rather than more wealth. And there, there's a certain wisdom to that, that, that accompanies their knowledge uh, of the facts that are going on right now. So, so yeah, everybody's going to choose their own path, but I think as this information gets out. And, you know, the other half of that is you see the youth, the same youth, um, becoming more activists in a way that we haven't seen in 50 years. Absolutely. Right? And so the awareness of what's going on with the youth is, is, is beautiful to see, right? And I support all of these groups. I mean, Extinction Rebellion and, and Just Stop Oil and, you know, go for it, guys. That's your path to deal with this, right? Not my path, but it's your path. And I support them because they're understanding the future and acting. And this is what I mean about doom creating action, right? They are acting, not because they have hope, but because they realize just how dire the situation is, right? It's a very interesting new world we're living in. It is, it's, um, it, it is a sad, sad world. And it is one that, um, I mean, it's so profoundly sad, and sometimes it takes my breath away, the, the, the sadness I experience towards what's going on. And, and, you know, it's sadness towards human fate, but it's really also sadness towards all the innocent species um, that are, are suffering from this, you know, whether it's koalas in Australia that are being burned alive, you know, whatever, wherever you are on the planet, you can find the species, you know, that we're losing over 100 species a day are going extinct right now, you know, 20 times the background extinction rate. Just, just what we are doing to life on this planet. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I see the process um, 
reducing humans' role on the planet in the next 50 years or so fairly substantially. Um, but I see the planet taking tens or hundreds of thousands of years to, to heal from us. So yeah, this, this legacy we're leaving behind is, is gonna be very ugly for this planet for a long time. The planet would have been better off without us. Um, Except for the art. Yeah, the planet would, would have been better off with our, uh, without us. But I really love art and music. I, I, and it, it's so funny, it's like, when those people poured the uh, tomato soup on the um, Van Gogh or whatever it was. Uh, and my reaction was like, look guys, anything else, just not art, just not art, right? Just not art. Um, so some of them kind of agree with that, but it turns out about 75% feel like art should be a target because it draws attention. So, uh, you know, I said my piece. What would your message be to people that are listening? Um, I would just say, pay attention more, pay attention to all the stories in the news that deal with the collapse of the planet. There is so much out there right now that on a daily basis, even five years, 10 years ago, you just didn't see it. There is so much. And start educating yourself about what's going on with not just climate, climate is one part of it, but ecological collapse, the collapse of civilization. And make choices, make your own life choices, understanding this is the future. And if I had my way, um, including those life choices, uh, choices to be generous and to be of service, you know, um, as much as you possibly can, as much as you can. and. That's, that's what I've decided to devote my life to for the rest of my life. Great talk, beautiful. Elliot, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on all this. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me this chance. Thank you very much.